Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. We got Tassos. And this week, after a little bit of a hiatus, we've been we've been gone a little bit. You know, summertime's always a little crazy with Just vacations. Just a minute. Just and, a minute. <laughs> yeah. A little sketchy, but it's all right. We're back and we're back with a vengeance. Uh, this week, we have Dennis Burgess here from Link Technologies and also TowerCoverage.com. So, Dennis, as many of you guys know, has been at this a little bit. So, he's got a, a ton of experience about WISP industry and stuff. And we're going to talk a lot about probably tower coverage uh, and all the new sort of filing requirements. Seems to be a real hot topic lately. So, thought we'd get into that a bit. His experience running a WISP and just a little bit of everything. So, before before we hop into that, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple, Google, or Spotify. Good job. Good job. We actually remember this time. Proud of us. Yeah, uh, I did good, right? <laughs> you did felt good. a little rusty. Felt a little rusty. <laughs> Well, y'all, let's make like a frog and hop to it here. So, Dennis, my man, we really appreciate you being here, taking time out of your busy day, uh, sit here and talk with us two slappies. And uh, like I said, just share some of your experience. I think it'd be good. Maybe kind of give us some history. Like, how how did you get here? <laughs> it's always a sort of super <laughs> generic, vague question I like to ask, but it usually, uh, usually gets to be pretty interesting. So kind of how'd you end up in this field? You know, where did Link Technologies come from? Where did tower coverage come from? And uh, we'll rock from there. Sure, sure. So we started, uh, I started an ISP back in Yeek 1999, I believe. Uh, we were using AirBridge equipment back then. Then we hopped to CB3s, then uh, the whole Star OS warboard <laughs> stuff, which was, yeah. I mean, that's all ancient with the Aronco Gold uh, PCI, MCIA cards and all that. Oh, yeah, that was uh, all fun stuff. Uh, and then uh, really in, uh, I think it was 2006 ish we decided that we needed to have a uh, company that could offer support for basically microtech. And originally it was also for star OS. We actually did a lot of star OS stuff uh, with what we call it our sister company called Jeffco Soho. Um, now come forward a few more years uh, in there. And then basically link technologies absorbed Jeffco Soho. Uh, so now we were selling hardware and we were doing consulting work, et cetera. Uh, moved around a few spots, trying to find a, a good home, a good spot for uh, good internet, as well as a good spot where we could grow as everybody has uh, those types of issues when they're starting a business. Uh, and then uh, we started towercoverage.com. That was uh, basically, we were offering a training class for Radio Mobile. I don't know if many people know that. Uh, the yep. author of Radio Mobile, Roger, he basically came to us and said, hey, we got this uh, interesting little online version, but we want to expand upon that. And I don't have the skills to expand upon it but I think you guys do. So uh, we basically brought him on as a, uh, uh, an engineer with Link Technologies. Uh, he's still working for us to this day. Uh, and we started towercoverage.com. And a lot of the feature set um, back then, uh, I had sold my WISP to uh, my business partner. He was actually a, design, uh, a driving factor in towercoverage.com usage because he's like, man, it'd be really cool to capture customer information from our website and have it email us a, a link path profile immediately. And I'm like, okay, let's go ahead and do that. And then we started developing uh, all the feature set of towercoverage.com. And, uh, you know, that uh, the rest is history. So we've been in business since 2006. I've been in the WISP industry since 1999, um, doing consulting work, everything from consulting to training, pretty much you name it. I've pretty much seen it and, and probably have done it. Now, there are a few oddball things uh, that are out there that, you know, you get like airspan, some airspan radios. Those are just weird. Um, <laughs> but once you've worked with them a couple of times, all the basic principles are the same. So that's uh, basically us in a nutshell. Well, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, you've, you've definitely been around a while, seen a lot of things. So the... Um, 
you know, as the technology in our field is advanced, it's, you know, you've seen that over years, you know, a lot of the, the planning used to be like, how do I put my radios together? How do I cobble this stuff together versus integrated solutions now, so on and so forth. And I think there's a lot more focus in the industry now on sort of bigger picture ideas where, you know, the tower coverage is a great example, right? Like, you know, for years, so much of the, the planning was just kind of dead reckoning, right? So like, well, I know I'm on this tower and I can look and see this little neighborhood here, this neighborhood here. But when you started moving towards expansion, you're like, okay, well, now that I've got the resources to build my own tower, I know how to do it. I can fund it. Like, where do I put this thing? Right. And, you know, and the driving around the neighborhood or surfing, <clears throat> excuse me, surfing through Google earth only really tells you so much. So, uh, I guess tell us a bit about how tower coverage works. Um, you know, from a planning perspective and things like that. And then from there, I think would be a good point to sort of jump into the conversation about how that ties into uh, a lot of the planning, the filing that it used to be and kind of where the filing and stuff goes now. So sure, sure. You know, a quick air, airplane view of things. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, as far as doing your coverage area, basically you can put a, a site down, set how high above the terrain you are, and then you can basically select a radio system. And that could be uh, a Medusa uh, 450M. It could be a Microtech radio. It can be any radio that you so choose. Uh, of course, you do need to know the proper RF uh, characteristics of that radio. And uh, we actually had a, a, a really interesting one. This happened a number of years back, but we had people telling us that our propagation was totally wrong. Well, the, what they were doing is they were using the old uh, canopy reflectors. And what they neglected to do is take the reflector gain and add it to the gain of the actual antenna. So they were just putting the reflector gain in. And, you know, it's it's all about knowing you have to know RF enough to be able to put the proper information in. But once you do that, we basically take our terrain data, um, which hopefully by later this month, we're going to be rolling out one ninth arc second data uh, across the United States to even be more accurate. We already have land cover data. So that's all your trees and stuff like that. Um, you basically pop it in and then within about 60 seconds, it will pop out a map that shows you your potential coverage areas. Um, normally, under normal circumstances, it should be within a dB or two ish. Um, we do have a slider in there that allows you to customize that. And that's basically an additional statistical loss. Uh, so further you are away, you'll have more statistical loss, if that makes sense. Um, but that's where we got started, uh, the basic premise of that. And then you take that, your coverage area, and you merge it into your, what we call multi-map, which is basically all of your coverage area. Once you get that, now you can do all kinds of things with it. So let's say you wanted to do your tower planning. So uh, in our particular case, we actually used a, and this is when, when we owned a WISP, we actually had a area that we got a whole bunch of what we call EUSs, and those are end user submissions from our website. We had a whole bunch of them, a whole little cluster of them. And we had people, we would always tell people, go to our website, fill out the form, because that is the only way we know where people are requesting service from. And trust me, you get some that are across the country every once in a while, that type of stuff. But we had a whole little cluster of them. What was that? I was like, New Jersey, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you'd know, you be surprised how many people fill those things out. Um, but now you have contact information, email address, phone number, all this information from a potential customer that's interested in getting service. So then you can go into that area and you go, hey, we got a cluster of customers or potential customers that has requested service that we cannot get them service currently. Now let's go find a FCC tower in the area. Maybe there's a tower that's registered with the FCC database that we import on a weekly basis. And you know, is there a tower that we can literally use? So then you can sit there and plot that tower. Here's this new site, here's the radios. Let's plot that and look at that. We cover 90% of the people in that area that have asked for service. So then what we did is we went to the tower owner. We said, hey, we want to get on. Here's all of our specs, all that kind of good stuff, just like you would with any other tower, per se. And then you basically enter into that agreement. Now, before we entered into the agreement, before we signed on the dotted line, we sent emails and postcards to every person that had submitted uh, on our website. And within about a month, we had 45 customers give us the $100 install fee pending tower installation. Wow. So 
literally once we went out there and we installed the tower, we signed the contract, we installed the tower, we had 45 customers to hook up immediately. And they were all pre-qualified. And I think out of those 45, I think there was one that said they, they didn't want the antenna on their roof or they didn't want it where it had to go. So that is a great way to do your ROI. Now, if you don't have a tower on the FCC database, that's fine. We actually have a reverse path analysis that you can select all the customers in an area, and then you basically let it process. And this takes a little bit because we're actually doing coverages uh, from the customer site saying, hey, I want to put a tower. Let's say it's 120 foot. I want to put a tower somewhere in this area, but I don't know where but I'm going to put a 120 foot tower. So what it does is it creates a heat map. So it takes each individual coverage says, here's all these coverages. It merges them all together and says, Hey, here's a heat map of where the best place is to put a tower. Then you can look on our site and you can actually do what we call uh, parcel data. We actually have parcel data and you can actually find out who actually owns the piece of property and then go contact them. Hey, I want to put a tower up on your property. It may work. It may not, but it gives you the tools to be able to do that if that's something that you want to do. That's really cool. It's it's come a long way since I, I've used it last with all this kind of reverse, let's say reverse engineering of mm -hmm. an installation, where to go from. I mean, these are all the things that even I've pondered myself. I see towers going up from some providers. I'm like, how do they know who the owner is? Who, how do they know? What do they do? They they find their home address and hope they don't get shot driving up the driveway to say, hey, can I put a tower on your property? <laughs> like, you know, it's like right. all this information. So you guys have, have come a long way with that. Wow. And we actually recommend that you would send them a letter or two uh, prior to you going out there. Uh, if you can go out there and you can see them from the road, hey, hey, you know, wave them down. You'd be surprised how many people will sit there and talk with you about internet. And most people, all they want they want internet. That's, yeah. that's, you know, if, if you're going to put a tower on their property, they're going to say, Hey, we're going to sign a, a 20 year lease for this property. Here's the process. Here's the cost, you know, and, and you have to put it in black and white. It has to be in black and white. I cannot stress this enough. Um, you know, we actually have, have done a lot with this telegraph system uh, that Cambium has. Um, FYI, Microtech will be coming out with theirs, hopefully by the end of the year. Maybe, don't know, we'll see. But the, the telegraph system is, is really cool. But now you have all these individual repeaters on individual homes. And I'm like, man, it, it just takes one customer to sit there and say, no, I don't want that anymore. And if you don't have an agreement that you can stay up on the roof, then guess what? You're, you're, real, you're gonna scramble to try to keep your customers hooked up. So yep. definitely always sign an agreement. I don't care if it's a $1 agreement, sign an agreement and exchange checks. No, that's definitely some good advice. You don't want to put all that uh, work and building your infrastructure. And the next thing you know, they're like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. So we, and we've seen yeah. that a lot, especially with micro pops from repeaters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, make sure there's reliable power, <laughs> you know, they have small details, things like that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, from a planning perspective, it's definitely more detailed than the first time I fooled around with it. We're like, well, we're going to get some balloons. We're going to fly them up in the air. We're going to drive <laughs> around to see what we can see. So... The uh, the mapping data has gotten so much more advanced, too, just in general. I mean, with the availability of LiDAR, you know, in a lot of areas, um, you know, where are you seeing the, the resolution of the LiDAR stuff in terms of coverage areas you know, that you're dealing with? Or like this new resolution data that you're talking about, you know, having a little bit later this year. Like, what's what's the resolution? Like, what does that mean for people in, in the that might not be tapped into it? Sure. So one third arc, arc second is what we currently use. Um, now that could be, and it is, in, it is in some very specific aspects, like the state of Kentucky. They actually made their lidar project open, uh, open to the public, so that you can go download all their data, etc. Now the big problem with lidar data is you don't actually have a whole lot of land clutter. So in other words, you don't actually know, hey, here's this tree or here's this group of trees, etc. Now you might have buildings, which is a good thing. Um, in some LIDAR cases, they filter those out, which is really kind of unfortunate, but um, that those are some of those things that you get. Um, one meter data is great. The only issue with one meter data is at, at, there is a point of you're getting so, so accurate that it takes almost too long to process while people are waiting. Right now, we're at one third arc second. So that's basically 30, uh, 30 feet resolution. Okay. I would almost argue 
that if you are going by the exacts, so like I said, if you're using another product and they offer one meter resolution data versus our 30, uh, 30 uh, uh, foot data, is it really going to be that much better than what we already have? Normally, I would sit there and say, the answer is yes, it is better, but as a normal usage, the answer is, do you need better? And I'm going to probably say not really. Um, one of the reasons why we've stuck with one third is because of processing time. We allow all of our customers to reprocess maps as much as they want. So if the process, if you go to from uh, one third down to one meter, using the same process that we have, it would almost be 14 minutes per map to process. Okay. That's not something that somebody's going to sit there and wait for. And I'm assuming that's probably why other vendors don't offer uh, an online site that you can go and adjust things. They just process them and then give you access to the maps, which is fine if that's what you want. But in all reality, if a customer is anywhere close to your coverage area, that you know your stated coverage area on your map, most likely you're going to send somebody out to try to do an install. Simple as that. I mean, it's it's it is a tool in the toolbox. It is not a definitive guide. And if they are a half a mile out, then yeah, then don't bother with them. But if they are anywhere close, go send somebody out. Um, yes, I have seen some instances, and they will highlight them where oh, they say you can go on this side of the house, and you're going to get this signal, and on the other side of the house, you won't get signal. Okay, yeah. that it doesn't really matter. You're still going to send a person out there to do the install. OK, um, again, that's probably the, the major difference. Um, the big thing for us is getting a accurate data set on a hopefully national or preferably global scale. Originally, the SRTM, which is the shuttle radar topology mission, uh, was the main source of our data. And that was a global data set. Um, we have parts of the UK that they offer, uh, it is one centimeter resolution LIDAR data. Okay. okay. But they don't even offer it to allow people to download the data in bulk. You have to go to their website. You have to hit submit all this good stuff. And then you can download one little file. And that little file is like 280 meg, but it's like this one little bitty snippet, you know, it's like 12 feet or something <laughs> like that, you know? And, Whenever you get into that that type of data set, you have to have a way to either download the data, be able to make it available, and then you have to be able to do something with it. And that's kind of the issue that we have is we don't uh, we do have staff that monitors that, and we usually update our data uh, usually at, once a quarter. So as like in the United States, as USGS updates their data set, we're constantly updating our best data set. OK, um, but like in the case of Kentucky, we were able to get that one meter data. They offered it uh, on a FTP server that's public. We downloaded it and we just up converted it to one third arc second. So it would work with our current application. The USGS has now standardized on one ninth. They do have some one meter data, but the one meter data is very few and far between. And even the state of Kentucky has not submitted that data to the USGS and or the USGS has not certified that data to be able to be available on the USGS website. So again, we're sticking with really a, a big government agency that knows what they're doing, the USGS. Uh, we are going to be releasing the one ninth arc second data, uh, hopefully, you know, within, uh, you know, this year. Um, but whenever that comes out, then we'll be able to, to get that even, uh, even more accurate for people. However, there is going to be a, a processing time hit on that. Sure. Yeah, we got like 250 cores of processing servers dedicated to tire coverage. So we have a lot of processing that we can do. It's still going to just take time to grab all the data. Uh, I mean, think about it. You have, you know, uh, you know, let's say 20 square, square kilometers of data that you have to read, and then you have to process on that. So it does take a little time, does take a little memory, not a whole lot of memory, but it does take time to do that. And we do have quite a few servers to uh, be able to handle that load. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Uh, that was something I was kind of curious about. We have our little link calculator on our website, and we know that sometimes there aren't enough squirrels running in the cages <laughs> <laughs> to make it process the tiles, right, for the MCS rates fast enough. But I was just, you know, I don't know how many cores we have or how much, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
bandwidth we buy from from Amazon from the cloud, yeah. right? But uh, I, I'm gonna find out so we can compare it to your 250 cores and kind of see where, where that is. But uh, yeah. s slightly kind of on topic, but off topic, right? This is something uh, you know, what you're saying is your output is obviously only as good as your input, right? Yes. So oh, yeah. the data that's coming into the system will will help you, you know, have a higher quality output. And something I've always wondered about, you, you mentioned earlier, some people said, well, you know, hey, your 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 tower coverage tool uh, isn't very good because they weren't putting the proper input of reflector game plus TX power to, mm -hmm. to generate these maps. And... Uh, I've I've wondered now as technology is changing because again we we kind of see this with our link calculator how how does tower coverage work or what do the 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 input parameters look like for newer technology like let's say even even in the case of uh, uh, of the Medusa right with beam forming is where I'm going specifically right because mm -hmm. the beam pattern changes right uh, you have stuff like Tarana that's coming out now doing some you know magical stuff with multipath and reflection so you know how does that all come in and even Mimosa with the A6 platform and beam forming so how I mean is tower coverage going to be able to calculate those solutions as well I mean is that something so, so the answer is yes. Um, for beam forming antennas like the Medusa product, um, Medusa or Cambium actually has created a .ant file um, that is representative of the peak gain that all the subscribers should be able to see uh, out of their antenna. And that peak gain is really what we're calculating on. OK, so when they have that antenna file, they can again, our end users can upload their own antenna files. Or we can get them directly from the manufacturer. And we always request that it comes directly from the manufacturer. It doesn't pass through a third party that's requested it because then people are going to say, oh, we're tampering with stuff. We're not going to do that. But we always request that, like Mimosa, whenever the, the B11 came out, where's your antenna files? You know, I, I understand you're using XYZ antennas. Where are those Jiris antenna files? And uh, they actually created them for us, and, and we got them online for them. Um, but again, in those particular cases, it's always usually the peak gain at that uh, the the bearing off the center uh, access. So even if you're doing beam forming, it doesn't really change the propagation model, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I have to I'd have to look at it. <clears throat> gotcha. Yep. I mean, don't get me wrong. There there is times when your signal will be weaker because you're not transmitting or you're not receiving data. But normally, whenever you're receiving or transmitting, you should be at that signal level because that's where beam forming should put you at, assuming gotcha. that the beam forming is quick enough anyway. Right. So. Right. right. Cool. That's a peak. And usually these differences are within the error margin or fudge yeah. factor. Yeah. Some of this mm -hmm. to an extent too, right? Yep. So... You know, that's the that's his his fudge factor uh, slider he mentioned earlier, right? So, <laughs> yep. And and I mean, you don't know. I mean, if you do, we do have multipath options now. The big issue with multipath is you don't actually know which direction it's going to come from. Um, you know, if you're kind going over point. water, right? If you're going over water, you can actually see the the waves depending on if you move the antenna in and out. You will actually see the uh, the constructive and the deconstructive interference across water but you know if you have a building that you just happen to be able to bounce off of that's going to be really hard to model in the real world so sure. again it is what it is in that particular instance yeah yeah i mean in the end too you're a lot of us you're just looking for the raw propagation right so yeah you know whether your radio can take a neg 70 and do magic with it well that's that's you know that's another sort of level that you've got to kind of approach from that perspective right so you in know, most we, of our customers we recommend that they use something like a neg 65 that way they know that they're within you know a good db a margin that even if you have a, a small tree or something in the way that we didn't account for, hopefully you can get around that. Right. Or your your uh your your installer having a little bit of the the crooked eye and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. <laughs> so with like non-line of sight propagation, mainly through foliage, right? You know, for the longest mm -hmm. time, you know, those assumptions were based on, well, if you're in this region, it's roughly this many dB per kilometer, so on and so forth. So right. you know, how has that sort of advanced over the years with figuring out what the propagation models are through the foliage? Um, the propagation model and that we used has not changed. However, the data set has changed. So 
part of our data set update every quarter is getting the latest land cover data from the USGS in our particular instance um, and or any other SRTM data that we can get. Um, they are constantly doing scans like uh, uh, Canada did some scans a while back and gave us updated uh, uh, land cover information. And in that particular instance, we applied it. And in some cases it helped, some cases it made it worse. Um, all you can do is sit there and assume that if you have trees there and you're using some frequency that can actually go through trees, that you can have a statistical loss of point A to point B, and that's our distance. And that's basically all you can do. Um, you can sit there and calculate worst case versus you know best case, but in many cases, we'll tell anybody if you're shooting through trees during the winter and it's not, they're not broadleaf pine trees that, you know, stay green all year, uh, then chances are whenever those trees come back, you're probably going to get 10 dB of extra loss. Uh, whenever they go and put it into their propagation model, the propagation model is going to show that loss. And whenever they go to install, they'll maybe 10 dB stronger. Well, that's because you're installing during the winter. Hmm. Wait until summer and see what happens. So again, it is knowing all of that information, you, you kind of have to keep that always in the back of your mind. Yeah, there's definitely some level of like knowledge, like you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So being able to put in mm -hmm. the proper right. parameters, but also it, you know, knowing and planning based on experience, right? So in a past life, I had to, to clean up a bunch of links that were put in because surprise, surprise, trees grow. So you know, hey, we're just shooting above the trees. No. It's a great link. It's an amazing. <laughs> and then you know, I mean, granted, it's it's eight years later, right? So that little pair of nano beams has paid for itself a, yeah, about a thousand times over at this point but you know you go out there and look and you're 20 feet in the trees and they're like yeah it just kind of quit working i'm like no it didn't this has been going on for a while but um or what's worse is whenever you get out there and then there's a rv parked right in front of the antenna <laughs> I, i've seen that one uh the the latest one happened about three weeks ago customer called us up said head we we did this link planning it all worked out we did an install and now we have a customer that they're they're not getting any signal I'm like, okay, and what do you want us to do about it? And they're like, well, we, we just wanted to know what, what your system says, and, and it says it should work, but yet it's not. I'm like, well, go out and check it. And they were building a garage yep. right in front of the, <laughs> the antenna. Yeah. I mean, again, if you don't have all the information, then you can't plan for it. And mm. those are things that, that they're going to happen. You're going to have to just chalk it up to experience and say, hey, we can move your antenna or, or do something else to keep your service. Yeah, there's a lot of those lessons we've all learned over the years where you're like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I <laughs> gotcha. Seen it now. So, yeah, garage fade or building fade in general. Uh, the RV one was always, I always thought it was amusing. Yeah, so, or our RV <laughs> one's awesome. <laughs> or like you said, the simple case of putting links up, you know, in the, the, the winter, you're like, Oh, it's nice and cool. going to get all this work done in the spring. Everything goes to hell. You're like, I don't understand. So, <laughs> right. So, you know, tower coverage does a ton with the, the mapping and the planning and stuff like that. Um, but then it also ties a lot into what your coverage area, like marking out your clients and then using that for your reporting data and stuff too, as I understand it. Right. So, yes, you know, sir. there's been a, a lot of hubbub, you know, 477 has been around for a long time. People should be doing what they're doing, but now we've got these new BDC requirements that are at a much more sort of granular level. And, you know, clearly, especially within our industry you know there's always a big fight against government oversight and overstep and this is not really the place for that but it kind of is what it is at this point but you know if you kind of give us some background as to what these changes mean for the industry like how does tower coverage handle it and where do you kind of see this going now and then you know into the future you know is this a one-time thing or do you think it's going to kind of get more granular you know just give us some insight there about this reporting because it's definitely been a hot topic lately well let's let's kind of start with what the form 477 is um for most wisps it is the broadband deployment data and the broadband subscription data and the subscription data is basically a list of gps locations or i'm sorry census tracts that are where your customers are currently installed and that's basically all that is um most of your billing systems should be able to output that data for you however if you don't have that ability Tower coverage, uh, we can ingest a listing of addresses and or GPS coordinates, and we can kick back the census tracks for that. 
Uh, so we can do that, uh, that little portion. The next portion is that broadband deployment data. This is where you cover and can get service in a reasonable amount of time. One of the things that the FCC just defined is what is in a reasonable amount of time. Because originally <laughs> there, there wasn't one. It was just a reasonable amount of time. So they just said basically 10 working business days. So 10 business days is it. Um, this is where you could give a customer a install within 10 business days with no extraneous cost. So you can't put up a tower or if you do put up a tower as part of their normal installation, then, hey, there you go. Um, but that is the deployment date. And that goes down to the census block uh, levels. Again, we can take your coverage area. We can extract the census blocks out of it. And then you also have to report what technology you're using and what's the maximum speed offered. That is basically Form 477 in a nutshell. Now, if you want to actually be able to receive funding for the areas, there's another portion called the VoIP requirement that you need to fill out. And all you have to have is one VoIP customer, literally. And you could sit there and charge, you know, you can put it on your website and say, hey, it's 100 bucks a month. As long as you have one VoIP customer and you offer VoIP, then now that can that area can be considered served. Okay. Yeah. Going forward, now we have the BDC, and this is the broadband data collection. Um, there are two methods, and I'm going to say uh, tell you about the second method. This is the polygon method. What it is is, hey, we want you to submit your coverage area that you can reliably get service to within 10 business days without extra costs. Uh, we want you to submit your polygons to us. So in other words, the exact coverage areas. Okay, that sounds great. But then the FCC says, oh, by the way, we need to know exactly where your towers are. We need to know exactly what equipment you're using, what antennas are you using, what direction are they pointing, what tilt do they have? Um, what model are you using to generate your propagation? What is your propagation data set, uh, vintage? So what year, make, model? They, they want all that in the left arm too, of course. Um, they want all that so that basically they can sit there and they can rerun your propagation and say, yes, it is accurate or not. That is one method that the FCC has uh, given us to do the uh, BDC requirement. The second method, which is much simpler, is by using what we call a location fabric. And that location fabric is actually built by a company called CostQuest. Uh, long and skinny of it is if you have filled out Form 477 in the past, as if you had been operating in the past, you should have received an email from them already. If you have not, then you need to go to CostQuest's website and you can submit it to their help desk that says, hey, I need my fabric data. They will give you all the counties that you have filed in previously. So in our case, we filed in Jefferson County, Missouri. So we would get Jefferson County, Missouri. But if we have one little spec in Washington County, guess what? We'll get Washington County as well. The fabric data basically says, here is a serviceable location. That's basically what they're going for. And that location has a specific ID, okay? What they want is they want all of the locations inside your coverage area that you can actually serve and the speeds at which you possibly could serve them, okay? It's actually, for us, it's actually not very difficult to get that. Uh, we just overlay your polygon on top of it. Then we extract out any data that's matching. We will have that service available by the end of this month. Okay. The difference is you will need to get with CostQuest, download the fabric data, and then upload it into our system, which is just a text file. It's not overly complicated. And then you will submit for your BDC information uh, with the appropriate multi-coverage map. Um, that is it. That's the only requirement. What are, those, what are the fabric IDs, the technology used, and what's the maximum speed that you would offer at that location? That's really it. Now, the very last thing is what we call the PE certification thing. And uh, WISPA, along with several other people, have went together and they basically argued the fact that, hey, do you actually want a certified electronic, uh, uh, what is it, a certificate of electronic engineering or something like that? Yeah, professional engineer or whatever. Yeah, yeah, professional engineer to certify these. And uh, I know several PEs that do this specific type of work. And the average cost for them to certify 25 tower sites with the coverage location fabric and certify that would be between fifteen dollars to $25,000.
The reason is they actually have to go out and they actually have to take measurements and actually say, yes, I can get XYZ signal at this point. So now I'm going to certify that particular coverage as good. They actually have to make those measurements or have somebody make them for them. So it, it's not an inexpensive opportunity. Uh, it, it's not an inexpensive proposition, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, they did just redefine it that you need to have a Bachelor of Science, and I think it's eight years. I think it might be seven eight, years, be seven years, seven years yeah. of experience uh, for a corporate engineering officer to certify it, or you have to have 10 years of experience uh, in the related technology field to be able to certify it. Now, I have a feeling most of our, uh, most of WISPA's members are going to fall into that 10 year category, um, yeah. which is a good thing, but um, there will be some people that they're going to have to, they're, they're going to say, Hey, we don't have a bachelor of science or we don't have 10 years of experience. We've only been doing this job for eight years. What are their options? And and right now it's to hire a PE, which there are not very many PEs in the United States that will be able to do this. So um, it is definitely, uh, what's the, the right term? Uh, the, the government overreaching, I think, but that's a whole, that it's all subjective to your pocketbook, I guess. I don't know that it's, yeah, not, not to get into the political part of that, right? But right. I don't know that they're necessarily overreaching. They're just, as usual, very inefficient and, uh, you know, asking for things to be done that really aren't necessary, you know? Well, yeah. And it, it, it's, it is definitely an issue. And there have been definitely people that are complaining. Um, the big thing, though, is that they're stating that there's going to be a $15,000 fine for per incident of incorrect data. And in all reality, that's not really going to come down. What they're going to do is there's an argumentative uh, process where somebody can say, hey, I tried to get service. I can't. They said I should. Can you remove me? And all, all you have to do is sit there and say, hey, that fabric ID, remove it. And that should be the end of it. Um, so it's it, the fines are going to come when people are one, drawing circles around their towers without doing any propagation. That And that happened when the Form 477 first started like five years ago. There was tons of wisps that just drew circles, you know, 10, mi 10, 10 mile circles around their tower. And that that's a really bad, bad thing to do, um, as well as anybody grossly overestimating that coverage. Um, sure. I would always say, you know, I would always underestimate it to submit it. <laughs> so you're definitely not going to take the uh, link distances that are like on ubiquity boxes. Oh, 20 kilometers. Let me just yeah. draw this circle. You know, they said so. It's on the box yeah, that, right yeah, here. Air Fiber 24 can do 24 <laughs> kilometers. Yeah. In the rain. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, but there you go. I mean, it, it is it is what it is. And uh, again, by the end of this month, we should have our BDC uh, processes. They're actually being checked right now. Uh, we're just trying to make it as automated as possible. And in any of those orders, we always say typically the order is ready within four hours. You'll get an email as soon as it gets done with the data. Um, there have been some instances where something didn't work right and they get a blank file. Guess what? We'll process it for free. Just let us know. We'll, we'll get it taken care of for you. Um, but Again, we are trying to automate that process, not just do a one-off process. And uh, it does does take a little effort to get done correctly. For sure, for sure. So it's, you know, not not a fun process, but I mean, this is kind of the reality of the situation is, mm -hmm. is more and more coverage areas, you know, are opening up for funding and stuff like that. Like there's got to be some sort of, of, of watching and monitoring that. And, you know, there's there's hearsay of a, a lot of the 477 data out there just being kind of janky as it is. And, you know, you can look at some of these pools and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how accurate this might be, but... Yeah, that's for and, sure, and the fabric so. data is, is not as accurate either as people may think. And we've already seen in the preliminary data inaccuracies of, hey, this is a serviceable location and you zoom down in and it's a freaking outhouse. <laughs> there you go. I mean, if, if you want to service an outhouse, go for it. But, you know, it, it's literally a, you know, a, you know a, a three meter by three meter square building of, you know, it's an outhouse is all I could think of or a shack or something. So. Hey, you need internet everywhere. I yeah, mean. yeah, there you go. I mean, you have to be, keep yourself busy doing something. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yep, yep, good for uh, catching up on Facebook. So There you go. There you uh, go. <laughs> 
Yeah, man, it's wild. And then you've got, I mean, like kind of like what you were saying, there's a whole like a tolerance stacking issue too, right? So you got, you know, this data set is a little janky, this data set's a little janky, and then like how realistic is some of the enforcement going to be where it's versus a data quality thing versus intent, you know, which always is the, yeah. the big question and stuff. So, And I, I really think every every interaction I've had with the FCC on any of the Form 477, they are more than willing to work with you if there's a problem. I've never had that issue where they're not willing to work with you. And that includes like Clio requests and things like that. Everybody's willing to work with you from the law enforcement side as well as the FCC side. The difference is when you turn your back on them, that's when the the fangs come out and all of a sudden you start getting uh, fines and stuff like that, which is not a good thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to figure a lot of these, it's like the IRS too. Like some of these big government organizations are, are spread pretty thin, right? So they're like, you need to do the right thing. And as long as you play along, let's just get through this. So, but they yeah. will throw some weight around if they need to. So, right. And yeah. usually they're friends, right? That's why I always used to tell people, you know, you start messing with the FCC and go through an audit and then surprise, surprise, tax man shows up. He's like, I'm going to audit you too. And then EPA <laughs> man shows up and he's like, you got some paint cans on the ground. So, cause they all hang out <laughs> at the same bars in DC, right? So yeah, yeah. there's, there's make, some make sort sure of like, your house. yeah, there's some sure sort of your house is in order before you, you go complaining to yes. anybody else. That's always a, right. a really good thing to do. Exactly. They've got some sort of jackass list. They're like, all right, so Bob here's on the list now. And they just all kind of <laughs> hammer down on them. So, yeah, they all show up. The, the black van pulls up and they all get out. I tax man and an FCC <laughs> guy. Hi, hey, we're here from the government. <laughs> we're here to help. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So. It's it's gonna be painful, but you know, eventually, once everyone figured this out over the next sort of several filing sessions, I'm sure there's gonna be a little bit of a te- you know teething issues and stuff too. Yeah. But. Well, and keep keep in mind the there is a it's actually a waiver is what the FCC issued for these PE requirements, and the waiver is only for the next three filing cycles. Yeah. So it's not that the PE is not required. It's only required and not required for the next three filings. Now, can they extend that? Sure. Can they change it? Sure. But we don't know what's going to happen. So right now for the next three filings, we have that opportunity to uh, one, hopefully get things changed uh, as well as uh, we have the opportunity to certify people. Um, As far as towercoverage.com goes, we do have a filing service fee that we can basically tack on to where we'll log in. Uh, You basically provide us with your FCC login. We will log in and you have to give us your certifying party. So who name, email, all that information. And we'll go ahead and file all that information for you. So basically here's my multi-map, get all the data and you give us the data. We run it all in bam, FCC form 477 and a BDC is done uh, within a few days. Uh, we do offer that service. However, we cannot certify those results. So you will still have to provide said certification. So if somebody, somebody's got to sign the line as the, who the garbage collector is before they submit it. Yeah. So. Yep. <laughs> cool. Cool. So. All right, so that's sort of the the background info, you know, tower coverage, and like I said, this this uh, four seventy seven BD these thing has been really a, a hot topic on the boards and stuff lately. So, but let's kind of roll it back just a bit here. You know, a lot of what we're into with this podcast and you know RF elements as a whole is uh, you know tied a lot into education. So, you know, we like we when we interview Wisp and stuff in here, and you've got a lot of Wisp experience, um, but you've also got the sort of the unique experience of being a consultant, whether it be you know, a lot of micro tick stuff, obviously, you know, you know, that you're very well known for, but you know, there's other consulting and stuff too. So I guess from, you know, an educational perspective, the, the guy who's got his wisp and he's like, all right, this is a viable thing. He's got 50, hundred customers, you know, just starting out, but mm-hmm. you know, they all seem to kind of run into the same issues and those issues have evolved over the years, you know, like, Oh, I shouldn't run this whole network bridge, you know, that kind of deal. Right. So, you know, and, and some of the times you know the 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 information has moved so it's like what we've done to say hey you know sector bad horn good so on and so forth you know as part Mm -hmm. of what our efforts are from that particular slice but i guess really a, a good thing to talk about now is you know for those sort of 
you know, upstart wisp, or maybe even that sort of, you know, sophomore year wisp, where you've made it through the hard part, you got customers, you're kind of figuring your thing out, but you see those big sort of stumbling blocks as to what's growing or what's next, and you're ready to bring someone in to come, you know, to, to help you plan for growth. You know, what are the things that you see, you know, you guys working with the most or where people generally kind of blow themselves up, you know, just something along those super generic lines, but you know, for, for those guys out there that are still figuring this out. Sure. Um, one of the things that we get a lot of questions on is, um, how to deploy the network. So we get a lot of people that say uh, these buzzwords like NPLS and VPLS. Um, that's one of those things that we get a lot of, of questions on. Um, I would always sit there and tell everybody this, just because it's a buzzword does not mean it fits into your network plan. You need to understand how it works. You need to understand how it can help your network. And then you can make an educated decision on, is it right for me or not? Uh, we have a number of networks that they have asked us, hey, we want to deploy MPLS. And I go, I know wow. your network. You have eight exit points. MPLS, VPLS is not a good fit for you. And here's why. Um, that is one of those choices. Now, we have other customers that they have one internet drain or they have one data center that they're buying you know, 10 gigabit or 20 gigabit at. In those particular cases, it's perfectly fine as long as you're not planning to go to another data center for whatever reason. Uh, again, that is, it's, it's a decision that the customer is going to have to make. And one of the things we do get a lot is we do get specific, so uh, specific consultants that do make recommendations without understanding the customer's needs or wants. Um, the customer needs to be able to support themselves at least to a certain extent. And uh, if you're not available, then they're going to sit there and they're going to try either other consultants or they're going to try to fix things and probably mess it up even worse than it was already done. So I would always recommend that you look at the consultants that you're going to use as well as look out how, how they're talking to you. Um, an example is, do they sit there and say, yeah, we can do that, not a problem here and, and we'll get it done. Let's get it done. That's not really a good consultant because all they want to do is they want to do, they want to move march forward with the network plan that you have no idea what it actually is. What I would sit there and do is say, here's the plan that we would like to implement. Here's the reasons why, here's the pros, and here's the cons to that. Because that's what you're paying a consultant for is to know what the consultant knows and to understand what are the pros and cons of any type of deployment that you're trying to do. Um, we get that a lot, uh, mostly because certain consulting companies, they have a cookie cutter way of doing things. That's the only way they know how to do it. Do it and it happens. Um, we will build out however you dictate to us, but you need to know the information and you need to know um, the pros and cons of those types of things. So that's probably one of the big ones in the network design realm. Um, another thing that we get a lot of is uh, we have a tower that is, you know, let's say it's a thousand foot and yeah, we have radios at 900 foot on it. And I'm like, okay, why are they at why? 900 feet? Well, because Higher's we have better, customers right? that are 20 kilometers out. Oh, no. Um, Again, that's probably one of the mistakes that people get. They think higher is better. And, and I'm like, it's probably better. Higher is better on backhauls, but that's assuming that you have dedicated backhauls. I would always put a ring down at, you know, 250, maybe 400 foot between there. That's probably the perfect area. Are you using horn antennas? Because guess what? Horn antennas work really good. Definitely, you know, we would recommend, obviously, RF elements for that. But again... Shameless plug there, <laughs> as Tasso ducks. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's what we we would recommend to get the best count of subs for per AP. Just the way it works. Um, of course, you have to sit there and say, "Here's the downsides. Here's the upsides." That's what you need to make sure that you're getting from your consultant um, above and beyond. As far as bridge networks go, uh, again, even layer 2.5, which is you know the VPLS stuff, it's perfectly fine and it is acceptable, but there are mitigation strategies that you need to have for loops as well as failover. 
And layer two is the hardest to get a mitigation strategy for failover. Uh, I know people say VRP, VRP. It does work when it works-ish. There are many things that you have to take into consideration. You need to run the entire path out to your tower and back just to run VRP. That, that's where your VRP needs to run. If you have a switch inside that it's just running between two, two routers, guess what? You're not seeing the entire path. So if a path goes down, is VRP going to fail or not? Most likely not. Um, another thing I don't like doing is what we call active backup routers. Uh, I know some people love active backup routers. I would much prefer a active active solution to where we can share the load, share the routers. And then if any router actually has a problem, all your traffic shifts over to the other router. The difference is we know that configuration is working because it's already moving traffic. <laughs> that's one of those things that I would highly recommend people to look at when they're trying to build. And, and that's actually brings us to a good point. A lot of times when they come to us, they want to build a redundancy. They've built out their network. Like you said, they have maybe two to 500 subs. They have that network. Now they're looking for how can we make our network more resilient in the event we lose a switch, we lose a router, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that we do. I think we do very well. Again, but we always do that active, active thing to where, you know, traffic is always flowing in both directions, uh, typically. Uh, so there you go. I'm um, just trying to think of some other things that you know, uh, common mistakes. Um, oh, using a AP with customers and backhauls on it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do yeah. it. They still do that. I see. Oh it. yeah, they I still do. It. They still do. Um, and and I I even have well that AP is only for backhauls. Yeah. No, no, dedicate backhauls. Dedicate, dedicate. I, I can't sit there and stress that enough. Point um, to point. Yes. What's point? point? To point. To point. What's airtime? I don't understand. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, we, we've we've run into those types of things. Um, manage your management solution, and uh, we, we can talk about monitoring. Um, I think every WISP should have not one monitoring system, not two, but three. Um, the reason why I say three is you need one that can give you that single pane of glass, so you can see your network operations are, are all the towers up or not. That's all I care about in that particular instance. Uh, you need another one that actually monitors things like uh, interface state changes, signal strength, uh, if they change more than 10 dB, et cetera, within a given time period. Um, obviously, it can monitor other items, uh, things like that. But that is a, uh, a monitoring system like Zabbix or uh, I'm trying to think PT PRTG, something that actually alerts you in the event something happens, but they don't have the best single pane of glass views, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then the third one that you need is one that is out on the public internet. And uh, there's Pingdom, there's Uptime Robot, there's tons of services out there. But that needs to be, is my network online from an internet perspective? <laughs> um, the one we use actually takes, uh, they have 14 data centers, and they have to have seven of the data centers confirming that something's down before it actually alerts you. So now even a regional failure won't actually sit there and wake you up. But if you do get one, but you better be on that because that's usually a, you know, that's like BGP reachability, that type of stuff. It's, it's a big, big item. So um, mostly because guess what? We have a lot of people that run internal uh, monitoring systems, but guess what? Whenever their internet connection goes out, they can't get alerts. So that's why you need to have that third party, uh, you know, monitoring system. I don't care if you want to host something in, in AWS or, or wherever you want to do it, go for it. But it needs to be off your network in those particular instances. So um, that's probably one of those one of those things. I see that all the time on Facebook. Hey, I have a tower and then I have a switch and none of my customers are getting online. Okay, what's your monitoring say? Well, I don't have a monitoring system. Okay, well, it's kind of, kind of hard to sit there and tell you too terribly much. Unless you know what's up and what's down. Yeah, the, the, I've, I've been blown up by the out of band thing, kind of unrelated to with stuff, but it's some general stuff too. I'm like, huh, haven't gotten any alerts. Uh, the alerts are yeah. people calling you because this shit broke, right? So yeah. I was like, oh, I didn't get any alerts because all my management's in band and now I have no band. So yeah, <laughs> all quiet isn't all good all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We yep. actually have a number of customers that have been deploying a lot of Microtech uh, LTE radios 
for out of band uh, access to their routers. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive for them to do that. And uh, if they get on a custom APN, they can uh, literally get on uh, a router somewhere and they can access those uh, out of band completely and works really well. And I have been known to route customers out the LTE connection every once in a while, but it doesn't work very well, but it, it gives them something if that makes yeah. sense. Yep. <laughs> yeah, pulled one of those accidentally too. Yeah, there was a twelve thousand dollars cellular bill that month. So um. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most people that it's like five to ten bucks a month for a sim and you know the hardware, and it, for them it gives them peace of mind that they can get into the equipment or hopefully get into the equipment unless there's a power outage or something like that. So um, that actually brings us to batteries, and you know, you you need to have battery backups. You need to have them tested. They should be mm -hmm. tested twice a year. Um, if they do not last where you need them to, then guess what? You need to replace the batteries or replace the system. Uh, simple as that. Uh, now, do I recommend you go out and get some, you know, lithium battle born, you know, thousand dollar batteries just to, for your system? No, but again, I would definitely recommend you test all of your batteries. Uh, cause there's a lot of people out there that when they're starting up, they think they put a battery in and, you know, four years later, well, I got a battery backup on that. Yeah, well, it's it's a four or five year old battery. Have you tested it? No. Uh, we actually had one customer, major. We'll try this again without knocking my uh, microphone down. Edit. <laughs> uh, we actually had another customer that had a a major pop site. Uh, you know, multiple ten gig waves coming into there and such, and they're like, "That site's down. I can't reach it. All of my customers are down." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I can't reach it either. I don't see the other end." We need to check power. I have a big 350 Chevy engine that's a generator. It's there. It should be online. I'm like, well, I understand that, but I can't see anything. We don't have out-of-band management, so someone's going to have to go there and check it out. He calls me about an hour later, and he goes, uh, I'm, I'm going to fire somebody today. And I go, why <laughs> is that? And he goes, the generator, was when I got there, was not running because it was switched off, not an auto. <laughs> as soon as I switched to auto, it started up and everything came up. The pole, four, four poles down, got hit by a car and the power was out, but the generator wasn't on auto. So again, that those are the, some of the simple things that people sit there and, and take for granted. But unless you actually check all that, you're, you're, you're flying blind. Yeah, there's there's so many times where you're like, all right, I've got a backup, and then you know I'll just trust this forever. You know, it's kind of like your backup router setup, right? Like, yeah, the backup was good, uh, but you forgot that you've been monkeying with the active router for the last three months, and guess what? It's different. So, yep. you know, yep. UPS batteries flat, generators that won't fire up. Like a backup is only as good as a, a tested backup for sure. Yeah, that's right. like every every UPS in my office. <laughs> <laughs> for, forever it's just like it's just one day i come in the computer's off i'm like damn it you know the battery doesn't hold the charge anymore but do i ever test it do i ever check it no i basically yeah when the computer yeah. starts uh rebooting or <laughs> the battery doesn't place. kick in that's when i get a new one you know where do people yeah. ups is cheap ups is so a lot of these yeah. cheap ups is one they're not pure sign uh or two like they'll be the really cheap ones where when the battery goes flat the power comes back up eventually, but it doesn't kick on. You have to manually go turn the on button, mm -hmm. right? Like I've seen that oh, blow yeah. people up and oh, yeah. know, on simple yeah. setups. And, and, and honestly, stuff. there's plenty of solutions out there. Um, the issue is cost. And whenever you look at like a 1500 watt, you know, APC, I mean, that's a couple hundred bucks, but then you go to an, you know, an actual industrial solution, the box to, to manage the batteries is about 500 bucks or more. And then you have to buy the batteries. But the difference is the runtime is 10 times longer. And you actually have an industrial grade unit that will power on whenever it you know gets power back. Um, another one that I've seen is where they're running just on the cusp of a 15 amp circuit. And when the battery, when the power comes back on, the battery comes back on and it starts charging. Mm. And then you go over the 15 amp breaker that they had and it pops the breaker and then you're out of power again. Mm. Uh, those are, are always interesting ones. 
Yeah, we've we've talked about power systems with a lot of people on this. Is where this is where you you start learning like the the more money and work I put into it upfront, like it pays in in spades in the future, right? And it's yeah. you know it's hard to focus on that when you're you know you're one guy shop just trying to get turned up and mm-hmm. stuff, and you look at some of these you know fancy boxes and you know ICTs and everything else. You're like, one, I can't afford this. Two, like, what the hell is all this? Like, I don't get it, right? But it's <laughs> right. You know, as you scale and grow, it's, it's understanding that. Or even, you know, even understanding how the internet works. Because, you know, when you're when you're green, you're like, okay, you know, I'm going to buy some internet from the internet, man. And I got the internet hole and I plugged in and I plug it into my router. And you might be really good at understanding how from your router to the rest of the network works. But if there's something that's not a binary failure on the internet hole, then, you know, that's a lot of times where people can really get blown up. I've seen that happen quite a bit, too. So... It, it's always DNS. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you found I, that I, too. I was, that's, that's, I, it always happens to me. Same yeah, thing. And I would always sit there and tell any, any wisp, especially if you're above, you know, 250 to 500 subs, run your own DNS. It's not that hard. It doesn't cost that much. And now you take all the guesswork out of you using a service that you don't pay for to run your ISP. I can't, I cannot sit there and tell, I probably get, we probably get, mm, I would say two to three customers or potential customers a month call us up and say, I have everything, it's working, but nobody's getting on. And it's literally, they're either using Google or Cloudflare. And Google is very bad about blacklisting IPs and they don't tell you and they don't sit there and tell anybody. All you can do is sit there and test it. And if it doesn't work, why are you not getting there? And then we've had instances where customers have put in their own DNS like Google because they think it's faster. And then there's some type of routing issue on the Google's network. And in this particular case, uh, the one I'm thinking of, it was an actual routing issue on Google's network. And we were not able to get the 8888. And guess what? All the customers that had put that in was not getting online. And it's not like you can pick up a telephone and call somebody and say, hey, you know, DNS isn't working because we're talking about Google here. I mean, good luck trying to get a hold of anybody. I don't even think they list the number on their, you know, type Google phone number and see how many numbers you get or how many numbers you don't get. Isn't that what Alexa is? Don't you just say, Alexa, my DNS isn't working. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You got to use, you actually got to use Bing. So you'll just Bing Google's phone number and it'll turn (laughs) on. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, they don't magically work. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, that's, it it happens all the time. And I would really recommend everybody run your own DNS. It's it's not complicated. Yeah, there was actually a whole big conversation on one of the lists like two days ago about that for for the exact same sort of thing. So there's, I seen it. I didn't, I didn't chime in on it. That's okay. (laughs) There's a lot more to the internet than 8888. So, and 44 in that either. So, 111? Yeah. Yeah. So I I got an interesting story that there could be a a little segue to uh, completing our, our uh, show here. Um, So I, I, you know, I've done a lot of DNS stuff in the past. And uh, I actually attended a NINOG once. And uh, this gentleman uh, who was presenting on DNS sec, uh, I actually followed his conversation and, and his presentation, really good presentation, et cetera. And then I get him uh, at the, the meet and greet afterwards. And we start talking, this guy makes, you know, six figures a year. And all his job is, is to take care of a DNS server cluster that his university has. That's it. That's his entire job. And he starts going in into DNSSEC and, and starts talking about all the intricacies with it. And I thought I was well-versed in DNS. After this, talking to this gentleman, I was, I was just dumbfounded how much I am ignorant about or was about DNS because of, you know, that's his whole life mm-hmm. is DNS and DOH requests and DOT requests and all these types of things. Um, so, uh, if you ever get a consultant that says, I'm not still learning, I, I know everything, fire them. Because I, every day, learn new stuff um, just by asking questions. And that's really the only way that anybody can learn. So uh, definitely you know, keep learning. That's a, a big aspect of, especially a WISP life. You know, when we started, uh, when I started my WISP, it was because we needed, we had a need. That's what most WISPs I see started. Uh, they they came because you know hey they're you know Jim started his with because his daughter needed internet access. 
there you go. And it ballooned into a business that, you know, he then eventually sold, but that's just the way uh, the internet, it should work. And uh, going to the cost of uh, the barriers of entry, again, that form 477, for the most part, all we have is the form 477 and the BDC. I mean, other than, you know, if you need license spectrum for a backhaul or something, everything else is pretty much provided for you or you can get your knowledge for. Um, so, yes, the cost of entry barrier has been raised up because of the BDC requirements. Um, but there are companies out there that can do that for you and do all the legwork for you. So it's up to you if you want to pay them. If you don't, then you're going to have to do that legwork. But never underestimate your time. And uh, your time is a valuable resource, too. So just keep that in mind. Yep, it's definitely. You know, you've always got to keep learning, and you know, there's there's also you got to understand your own limitations. You know, just whether it's this world or life in general. I mean, Lord knows I got mm-hmm. plenty of mine. So you know, you you got to know something, but you ain't got to know everything necessarily, or at least until you grow to the point where you can bring someone in. So you know, uh, you got to bring in a consultant or something. That's great, but also <laughs> understand what they're doing. Have some idea. Like you can't black box everything forever. Uh, cause at some point it's just not going to work. So, but yeah. And, and we've, we've seen countless consultants and I'm not going to name any names cause, uh, I, I feel that I'm better than that, but we've seen countless consultants sit there and they cookie cutter, a network solution for a customer. And then the customer calls us up and says, Hey, we can't get a hold of them. Our network's down. We have network issues. We don't know nothing about it. You know, we were told we had to have this box. That is a you know forty five hundred dollar uh, remote. Co- uh, it's a council server, and I'm like, why? Why? Why do you need that? I, I don't understand that. Obviously, to get in remotely, but there's other ways of getting getting that accomplished that doesn't cost that much, and it happens all the time. So you know, always you know, challenge your your consultants and ask them those questions because if you don't know how your network operates, then you can't do any troubleshooting. Yep. 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 For sure. So. Well, cool. This is a, this has been a great conversation in this. Uh, I think, you know, we, we've learned a lot about some of the new stuff we've covered, you know, a lot of the things, like I said, it's always fun talking about how people blow themselves up or honestly, it's a lot of it's how we blown our own selves up doing stuff. So uh, yeah. I heard a story about a guy like some dumbass did this. Yeah, that was me. So, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, but no, this has been a great conversation. So Dennis, uh, anyone out there looking to, to find you or track you down, uh, for good or for not, <laughs> how can how can they find you? Uh, the simplest way, linktext.net is our website, uh, or you can give us a call. Uh, that number is 314-735-0270. Uh, standard business hours, just give us a call. You can talk to anybody in our sales staff. They can help you out and get you some estimates. Uh, we do do work uh, by the hour, so it is uh, there is no contract pricing, so you can buy a bulk bulk amount of time, and then we can work on it. And if you only use two hours, then we only charge you for two hours, et cetera. So um, that's the simplest way. We uh, uh, also can be reached via support at linktext.net as well. Uh, and for any of our towercoverage.com subscribers, uh, support at towercoverage.com is free, as well as our uh, support phone number is free during normal business hours. So just give us a call uh, or send us an email. Well, cool, cool. Again, thank you for your time. Now, Tassos, where can I find us except for the place that they're literally talking to us right now? <laughs> you could find us anywhere on social media. Literally right here. On, but <laughs> yeah, LinkedIn, you could find us on the gram. You can find us on Facebooks, you know. So yeah, everywhere online, especially our, our website, rfelements.com or our forum, rfelab.com. So uh, email is always available. And, uh, you know, a DM is uh, probably the best way to, to reach uh, either of us. All right. All right, guys. Well, Until we talk to all you guys next time, y'all be good out there. Yep, everybody be good. See ya.